All right. Hey, everybody. Um, I am Caleb Koppinen. I am a junior here at Columbia. I, uh, I do events for the Blockchain at Columbia Club, and I also run governance on compound finance. Uh, I do a couple other things in the crypto space. I'm a digital asset analyst at a firm called R360 Global, and I, I help build some courses at Columbia Business School. Um, this is the, the Why DAOs panel, this fantastic group of gentlemen to speak about DAOs today. So first, let me ask, um, who here knows what a DAO is? Cool. And who's ever participated in a DAO? Awesome. That's what I thought. So we definitely have a lot of people who don't know what a DAO is. Um, so this is why DAOs, but we'll start with what here um, because of that. So it'd be great if you guys could just all briefly introduce yourselves and then give maybe one, two sentences about what a DAO is to you. Can I start here? Sure. I'll start. Here. Cool. Hey guys. Um, yeah, I don't think it's on. Hello? Oh, yeah, there we go. We, we might not need it on the city, but uh, anyways, yeah. Um, Carl Bergman, I work at Reverie. We're a governance advisory uh, that focuses on uh, partnering with a few different protocols across helping them scale, launch, and just kind of engage community across their DAOs and, and their governance on uh, specific protocols. Um, to, should, should we answer kind of what DAOs now? Yeah. Cool, yeah. So for me, a DAO really represents kind of a structural ability for an online community to collaborate on a shared mission. Uh, so it gives people the capacity to uh, work together, collaborate, and just kind of join forces in a very autonomous, open way to accomplish uh, goals and just kind of the mission of the underlying protocol project or whatever it is that the community has banded together to, to do. Uh, hey, I'm George. I lead uh, business and operations for Commonwealth. We're an uh, all-in-one DAO tooling and governance platform. Um, currently power communities like DYDX, Osmosis, um, and about a thousand others. Uh, generally, I would say, you know, in short, a DAO is a group of people that agreed upon um, a set of rules for governing their shared interests. Um, and you know that can be as comprehensive or not as possible. Um, I think when that is applied very well, it's a means of um, coordinating action um, in an extremely scalable um, manner with very little central control. Hey, I'm Paul. I work at Gauntlet. Uh, Gauntlet is a B2DAO company. We provide uh, risk management and incentive optimization services uh, to decentralized protocols. Um, to me, what a DAO is, is probably a community-led uh, organization that lacks a single authority or a single point of failure, um, where the governance uh, structures and practices are encoded, are probably enforced uh, primarily by code. So that's a DAO to me. Hey everyone, I'm Azim. I lead partnerships and fundraising at Gitcoin. We help fund uh, digital public goods in open source software through our grants program. To date, we have given out about $70 million in grants and many of the most successful Web3 projects you guys know were originally grantees. <clears throat> I think a DAO is just a digitally native LLC, which can be simple or complex. It's like a group chat with a bank account. If it can be as complex as you want uh, any corporation to be. Um, hey everyone, um, my name is Amit. Super excited to um, be here and hope to connect with um, a lot of you one on one um, after the panel. Um, I have uh, two roles in crypto. Uh, the first is um, I lead Treasury for Friends with Benefits, which is a social DAO. Tagline is where crypto meets culture. Um, and then secondly, I'm the founder of Chainforest, which is a venture DAO. We have a $30 million venture fund and a community of 400 Web3 operators who get to earn a token, uh, which is backed by carrying the fund for helping with the um, investing process. Um, you know, I like to joke that what most of us call DAOs, which stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization, they're actually centralized manual um, organizations. Um, and I think... Um, um, 
the the term is uh, so challenging to define. Um, I, I thought everyone on the panel did a great job, but you know, I, I do look at uh, Bitcoin as the as truly uh, decentralized and autonomous, and what we now refer to as DAOs is more organizations that are a little bit more democratic, a little bit more community oriented, typically have some um, agency uh, over a treasury um, in a more of a collected form. But I think part of the challenge with uh, defining DAOs is the fact that uh, we've been a little bit too loose with it. And we've also been a little bit too loose about what really should be a DAO. So I'm excited to dig into that with you guys uh, on this panel now. Awesome. Yeah, no, thank you guys. Um, and it's, it's just really interesting how uh, even among experts, definitions vary uh, quite, quite, quite greatly. Um, so the next question I have is, is you know, you mentioned that DAOs are, are pretty wide ranging um, and we consider Bitcoin a DAO. Um, that's, that's really interesting. Um, so what, what do DAOs allow you to do or what have been some things that DAOs have allowed you to do that would otherwise be impossible? Um, and then maybe maybe we could start at uh, maybe in the middle of this one with uh, with Paul and then go out that way. For sure. Um, yeah, I think it's difficult to um, talk about DAOs without talking about just crypto and, and DeFi in general. Um, I think, you know, people talk about how, number one, um, DAOs are sort of you know, permissionless. Anyone can sort of use them. Uh, number two, uh, DAOs are censorship resistant. So it's not like, you know, um, a bank can you know, shut down your bank account. Um, as a result of those, um, you know, DAOs are, I guess, uh, trustless. Uh, the services that DAOs provide are trustless. Um, but I think if you abstract away from that a little bit, I think DAOs sort of allow for very unique capabilities that kind of fall outside uh, traditional institutions. Uh, one of those is probably um, greater collaboration. Um, you know, if you want to work for a company, for example, you kind of have to get like hired by the company. But in a DAO, um, you know, people um, can kind of just go in and contribute um, without, you know, third party uh, intermediaries, without those traditional frictions you have. So I think number one, there's potentially greater collaboration. And number two, uh, because a lot of this stuff happens publicly or, or on chain, um, you know, DAOs are a lot more transparent um, and decisions are being made by a broader community, uh, usually, um, as opposed to, you know, a small group of people. Um, so in, in that sense, you know, um, DAOs have the potential to be a lot more uh, fair um, and equitable. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, I'd say, especially being at Gitcoin, one of the most fascinating things is how easy and frictionless it makes it to hire people and pay people. The actual recruiting part is quite difficult, but in terms of being able to have like this spun up magic made up money that a bunch of people agree is worth something that varies a lot. But for us to be able to say on a monthly basis, this person in Sweden or India is going to get paid this much USD equivalent based on what the spot price is and being able to just do that as opposed to the amount of red tape that would come into me being able to do the same thing using JP Morgan is one of the things that I find completely fascinating about them. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I'd say the frictionless nature of being able to do international or global business. Um, I, I'd say there's like, uh, I would say there's uh, two things that really um, stand out to me about um, how uh, organizations in a DAO form have real advantages. Uh, one, which really is sort of just doubling down on your point about transparency. I mean, there are these projects out here that have hundreds of millions of dollars where essentially the balance sheet revenue is completely transparent every second of every day. And that's so dramatically um, superior in transparency relative to a traditional public company. And then anyone can join the message board and engage in the management leadership team and say, hey, I observed X, Y, and Z. I would suggest this or suggest that. And so that transparency and that collaboration you know, should result in significantly superior performance um, over time. And that's really quite incredible. Um, the, the second, um, any um, economists in the room studying, um, you know, traditional economics? Um, okay, well, uh, great. So like, um, uh, there's a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist named Ronald Coase who described the theory of the firm and said, it all comes down to transaction costs. Um, basically, we all work jobs because it's too hard on a task by task basis to um, assign people um, 
um, um, a role, you know, or uh, assign people like a, an assignment. So instead of saying, hey, you know, um, here's five thousand dollars for this PowerPoint uh, presentation, um, they say, hey, I'll pay you, you know, sixty thousand over the course of the year. And I think DAOs really sort of create this incredible liquidity and fluidity of employment that we haven't been able to have before. It's like the mix of being fully remote and fully digital and saying, hey, here's a bounty for something, you know, come in and help and offering compensation on this sort of piecemeal, more microtransaction basis, which could be really sort of quite transformative. I, I think the actuality of that is, is much tougher um, in reality for all of us working in DAOs, but I, I do think that uh, both the transparency and the fluidity are, are quite incredible. Yeah, sure. So I'll actually echo on that and kind of hop on that one and, and speak to yeah the elimination of barriers to entry for new people that are looking to work in fields that they're super interested in and have uh, genuine passion for. DAOs enable people to actually pursue those paths. And, and if you are able to find a DAO whose mission you really feel strongly towards and, and you can you know get behind, then there's a good chance if, if you begin contributing to it and, and you become an active participant, you'll be able to then pursue what it is that you're really interested in. You know, it could be working on some sort of development thing. It could be like, you know, treasury or whatever it might be, whatever way that it benefits the DAO. Like uh, the DAO just kind of has very low barriers to entry traditionally that that um, has been um, kind of the, the ethos of it and has enabled them to scale. And then on top of that, you also have this increased accountability on behalf of community members that hold the whole thing together. Um, there's ways in which that can be detrimental. So we need to be a bit careful how far we go down that path. But generally speaking, that sort of openness and autonomous setting is preserved through like a shared accountability of actions being done on behalf of, of any contributors, which which is also a very interesting way to operate because um, in, in, yeah, it, it just kind of allows everybody to, to be much more collaborative and, and cooperative um, in that setting, yeah. Um, yes, definitely agree with, you know, much of what's been said here. I think sort of taking a slightly different direction, I think DAOs are really a new way for stakeholders uh, to agree on decision-making for a set project. Uh, and so, you know, what's interesting here is, you know, in a, a traditional corporation and like large endeavor within the world, you typically have like some sort of centralized authority who's in charge of, you know, calling the shots. So with this, it's, you know, your CEO, your board of directors, um, and really everything sort of stems down from there. Uh, things have to go really wrong for their authority to be uh, halted and uh, transition to a new leader. Um, in some of these newer organizations, you know, we'll go with like um, Osmosis um, or, you know, any large DeFi DAO as an example. Um, you know, you have a combination of, yes, like major VCs that have invested early, have a major stake in the game, um, and have a vested interest in ensuring things go well. Uh, and they get actual voting control on a regular basis, not just you know, uh, at an annual meeting when there's, you know, a vote of shareholders. You also then can start getting much more active control by the, um, uh, like, specific action leaders. Uh, and so with that, that's your, like, risk management team, your asset listing team, your marketing department. Whereas typically uh, in an organization, you have, like, all of your OKRs, like, objectives and key results that, like, start at the bottom of, like, hey, get, like, this many impressions on Facebook ads which all rolls up to like, you know, increase our bottom line X percent. Um, and here you can have it much more like risk management determines like are things working well? Um, and then their employment and their continued funding comes from the shareholders who will continue to allocate budget uh, for them to do their jobs. Um, and so, you know, it, it really changes this way in which uh, work planning gets done um, and that can be very good. It can also lead to uh, very bad examples, like when Maker ends up laying off an entire division of people because of uh, an on-chain vote. Yeah, no, awesome. Um, and definitely uh, accountability and fluidity were, were both mentioned a lot here, um, which are which are quite contrasting ideas, uh, especially when when it comes to DAOs. 
Um, so, you know, I think now we'll, we'll move into a little bit of, of the house section um, and talk about kind of how to how to do bad DAOs the best way. Um, so, so there's kind of two conflicting uh, ways that DAOs are commonly organized now. Um, and, and one is kind of one is kind of like a company uh, wherein DAOs are, are pretty centralized in, in decision-making. Um, and then the other one is, is more like a democracy where, where DAOs are completely decentralized in decision-making. So I'd love to ask you guys what you think uh, one of bo both sides of this and kind of what types of DAOs or decisions ought to be on each side. And then two, if there is somewhere in between or something else I'm not thinking of, that's a great way to run a DAO. And why don't we start maybe uh, with, with George again? I know you just finished speaking, but you work on communication a lot. Uh, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so generally I, I hate the word DAO um, and I also hate the word uh, decentralized slash decentralization, whatever, all variations. Um, you know, not, nothing is really truly like decentralized or not. It's really a, a spectrum and it's about ensuring that, you know, whatever your like state is, is at like the proper level of requirements for what it's supposed to do. Um, so, you know, like even like Bitcoin, uh, you know, being like a DAO, um, I agree. Um, but also at the same time, there's like three miners who make up the vast majority of Bitcoin transactions. So like how decentralized is it? Um, but it's decentralized enough that it works and we all agree that it works. And for that reason, it's fine. Um, with that, you know, it's like, if we look into like democracy or like, you know, governance within the U S um, you know, I don't want to have to approve somebody renewing their driver's license, but I do want to be able to vote on, you know, who is the president of the United States. Um, different decisions will affect different stakeholders, you know, differently, um, saying different too many times. Uh, but, uh, you know, from there, I think there needs to be more off-chain governance. Um, generally, I think, you know, at the end of the day, whether they're corporations, DAOs, whatever you want to call them, it's still people building something. Um, and you need to be able to give a lot more autonomy to those people to actually do their jobs versus try and give, like, everybody a say in every single decision. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll go next. Um, yeah, totally, to totally agree with that. Um, just, uh, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. You, you go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, I think like the the term DAO, um, you know, isn't exactly entirely accurate. Like these aren't autonomous organizations per se. Like there are like people who need to decide uh, governance frameworks. Um, I think Vitalik just came out with an article on, on DAOs that some of you uh, may, uh, may have read already, but essentially like, you know, you can broadly categorize uh, decisions into two categories. Uh, one category is like, um, you know, if you can think, if you lay out the utility in, in terms of um, whether, uh, how am I gonna describe this with a Vitalik? I don't know, uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, basically like there are two scenarios, right? Like one type of situation is like a compromise is better than, you know, the two endpoints. Uh, um, another situation is where like the decision to go or not go or like two very distinct um, outcomes is better than, has a higher utility than going to a compromise. Usually when a compromise has higher utility than the two endpoints, um, that is where like DAO decision-making makes the most sense. When there are decisions that like are either or, you know, that's when like compromise is probably not in the benefit of efficiency. Um, so I, I think, you know, as Kayla mentioned, there are broadly two types of governance structures, I guess, is like, you know, everyone voting to decide on an outcome, or it is like, you know, committees, I guess, deciding upon an outcome. I think it really depends on uh, the function of these uh, decisions, you know, for a decision um, that is about, you know, how much should we, you know, fund a certain project that probably should be decentralized. Um, but for a decision that, you know, requires more like expertise, you know, for example, like security, security audits, it just doesn't really make sense to have a bunch of individual contributors 
um, that are all like independently trying to you know audit um, a piece of code. It probably makes sense for more like centralized parties to take on that responsibility. Um, so yeah, at, at a high level, like I think you know decentralization uh, that spectrum varies. It just depends on what function it is trying to accomplish. I think the I read that same article by Vitalik in preparation for this panel. It's called DAOs are not corporations. So you should, we can guess where Vitalik comes out on this. Um, but um, my takeaway was, you know, at the very end, he wrote, there are protocols out there that replicate government functions. DAO is, or DAI is um, really a, a currency. Like that is something that typically a, a government is in control of. And so he says, naturally, we would want that to operate much more like a democracy than um, a corporation. Um, in contrast, when I was designing my venture DAO uh, chain forest, <clears throat> um, I looked at the way that investment DAOs were being structured and you know, having democratic votes uh, in order to decide um, what, what the portfolio should become. And I said, hey, I actually don't think that really makes sense. I actually want it to be more centralized. I think that's going to be faster. That's going to lead to better decisions. It's going to lead to someone who understands the whole portfolio. And so um, I, I think you referred to this as a spectrum, right? And I think that's exactly right. Like for anything that's a DAO, we should really be thinking about what are the elements of transparency, composability, community that we want to um, incorporate. And for each different market and each different product, we want to think about these different dials and what really makes sense. Um, and when I did that, I said, hey, the traditional investment DAO, I really don't think the way we're doing it is the right way. And I changed those dials uh, myself. So I think on one, one hand, we have things that look like companies where we got to really think about where those dials sit. And the other, we have things that truly look like government functions and should be governed like a democracy. One place I'm going to start is I'm going to disagree with George. There's a lot of people I wish that I could interject on whether or not they would actually get a driver's license. Um, <laughs> but uh, when it comes to DAOs, an interesting thing I've seen is just like so much of stuff gets voted on and with like a 99% yes or a 99% no. And so I, like I'd love for people to actually say that there's like much decentralization occurring because uh, I don't find that there is. One of the big issues that I find in DAOs now, <clears throat> and that's speaking from being at one of the more well-known and larger ones, is I think that where there are no clear hierarchies in certain things, unclear hierarchies develop. And so there's like shadowy clicks that actually get to run things. Uh, and that's one of the issues that I, I think that a lot of DAOs are encountering, where we say there's no organizational principles and there are no bosses and there's like there's no leaders and there's no this. But like in reality, if you're sitting there behind the scenes, there is actually a lot of those things. It's just that they're not uh, they're not advertised. And so I think that we still honestly have a long way to go uh, before before we get to a place where we can actually say things are decentralized. But what makes it difficult is the same way that the United States works is where like no one wants to actually vote. Um, like we have like such a small percentage of people who care to actually go out and vote when it comes to even our presidential elections, never mind some of the smaller stuff. And so getting people to care about voting, like there's so much voter fatigue if everything needs to be on chain, it just doesn't actually work. But then at the same time, the only time people are actually upset about their vote not counting is when it ends up negatively impacting them. Uh, I think that's more of like a human problem that technologists like us think that like technology will solve, but I think that there's more human layer things that we need to work at. And as we've taken away the human element of interacting in a remote way, we're in this more difficult place to solve more human problems. So I'm really curious how they go. I'm, I'm optimistic about where it turns out, but um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a sticky place at the moment. Yeah, definitely. I, I think, yeah, it's just like you said, at the end of the day, DAOs are really just a set of humans who have come together and decided to collaborate on this one mission that they're on. And as a result of that, they're going to share the flaws that all humans have. And we're going to see the natural, like, power-driven compulsion that humans have proven to be compelled towards as well. And with that, you see power factions, you see divisions, you see just kind of, like, the usual politics that, that comes about. And I think that is... Something that does happen when DAOs do lean more towards like the democratic setup versus the organizational setup where you have a bit more of a clear 
segregation and delegation of responsibilities across these these communities. But I do think that the, the beauty of DAOs right now is uh, the experimentalism that's happening in these structural like organizations and and like the building and and everything that we're seeing is. Um, I, yeah, I, I think like a, a really cool thing would be for us to move away from trying to like define it. Like, is this a democracy? Is this an organization? And just be like, this is a DAO and it is what it is really uh, because all of them are, are uh, quite unique in, in their own little way, even though we are seeing some overlapping here and there, but um, yeah. Cool, yeah, awesome, Carl. Um, and I totally agree with you that like a DAO is is a DAO um, and that's kind of just it. And what that means is that a DAO can be used for a lot of different types of things and it's not so easy to, to find those types of things. So I think two types of DAOs we've been talking about today a bit are one, uh, DeFi DAOs, uh, wherein token holders kind of vote on governance changes to a protocol that's doing something active in the ecosystem. And then also investment DAOs, which Amit spoke about a, li a little bit, which is uh, kind, kind of like a, a group chat with, with a bank account that buys different things. Um, but there are definitely a lot of different types of DAOs beyond this. Uh, one really cool one I was a part of in 2021, I'm not sure if any of you heard of it, was called Constitution DAO, uh, wherein it, it almost functioned as a uh, a decentralized like special purpose acquisition company where we raised i think it was in and around 15 million dollars to buy the only publicly available copy of the u.s constitution uh we were outbid by ken griffin of citadel but nevertheless it was a really fun experiment so i'd love to know if you guys uh really know of or think about a lot any other alternative DAO structures that maybe people don't think of all the time and what those are. Maybe here we could start with uh, Azim if you're ready. If not, anyone feel free to jump in. Let me think about it a little bit more. One of you guys can go. So I'll, I'll tee it off with the, the easy ones. Uh, I feel like generally I look at like there's social DAOs where more or less it's, uh, you know, a group think your Soho house model, uh, friends with benefits, definitely, you know, one of the prime examples of that. Um, you know, the goal isn't necessarily to do anything so complex on chain, but it's more about uh, bringing people together, having sort of like, you know, uh, rules of attendance. Um, from there, you have your, what I'll broadly call protocol DAOs. Um, and so these are, you know, brought together for the purpose of building and governing some sort of product. Um, you know, right now we see a lot of that skewing towards DeFi, but uh, you know, you can have other kinds of DAOs as well. Um, and then lastly are sort of like investment DAOs where it's like really the core decision-making is more about allocating funds into other projects um, and making some sort of financial return together versus uh, working together um, on your like own work inputs to a central um, sort of product. Um, and then from there, I think sort of the, the next little subsection that I really like are um, like fractal DAOs. And so then this is where you end up getting a lot more of the actual work product um, getting done at like a sub DAO or like working group pod. There's lots of different names for it, a uh, model um, versus having as much control at a, a central level. What, what's an example of a uh, fractal DAO? Uh, so I think Maker is like the yeah. best one. Got where, it. Yeah. Um, so I will add um, uh, three more um, types of DAOs. Um, um, one is um, an NFT DAO. I think Nouns is like a really great example of sort of the 2021 generation of DAOs. I think it's one of the few that actually works where the money you paid for your NFT goes into a treasury and then you get a vote on how that's used to sort of propel the value of nouns going forward. So it's a relatively simple um, and straightforward um, um, concept, but it's really one of the few that that um, I think works out of this uh, next generation. Um, <clears throat> the D side DAOs where, you know, people might be um, investing in research on different types of um, uh, like clinical trials or, you know, types of drugs. Um, and then um, that does re result in an economic benefit if that works, which goes back into the, the treasury. 
Um, and then service DAOs, um, I think, are actually one of the best um, to use this DAO format where you've got a bunch of designers together, a bunch of lawyers together, and they're able to sort of allocate um, uh, work or work will come into the DAO and people can kind of come in and leave. And um, I think that actually works uh, quite well. So those are those are three additional ones. And I think all those actually work pretty nicely. Yeah, I, I don't know that I can add to, to this list. I think maybe we've covered it. I don't know, maybe not. Service that was going to be mine as well, but you got me there. So I'll just I'll use this as a confession, which is that I have only ever participated in DeFi DAOs. Actually, uh, I I need to branch out clearly uh, per this discussion and join up with easy. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I'm down. I think I think like uh, the fact that DeFi applications are largely having this DAO format are it's really underrated, and I think it's one of the best um, uh, like products to mesh with the DAO because you know you the the metrics or the product decisions really are sort of numerical in nature, so it can make a lot of sense to um, vote on them. Um, you know, obviously there's this sort of like short term, long term interest and like whale issues like if you know you might want to get mass payout and whatnot like people have talked about some of the issues that come with it but i think what's really underrated when people talk about DAOs, like everyone talks about the sort of the, sort of the social ones like constitution dow etc but i when i look at best practices i think a lot of that happens in in d5 yeah i think cool yeah so just to comment on one thing too. Uh, one one other example of uh, of a fractal DAO from that Vitalik article that that Paul referenced uh, is Ukraine DAO. Um, and Ukraine DAO is kind of set up so there's a top level uh, domain to send money to and kind of for all the donations to go to. And then there's there's kind of voting to form smaller pods. Um, and these pods have smaller committees that actually drive impact in Ukraine and are in charge of figuring out where the funds go to. Um, so I wanted to flip a little bit on the other side of DAOs now. We've talked a lot about kind of DAO structure and the best way to create a DAO from the, the administrator side or in, in this ideal form of DAOs. Um, but now I want to flip it on the participant side. Um, you know, I'm a member of a DAO called Radar DAO. And we've taken the, the quote that uh, JFK said um, that, that starts as, uh, ask not what your country can do for you. And we've repurposed it for DAOs. So it's ask not what your DAO can do for you, but what you can do for your DAO. So if you're somebody who's maybe getting involved in DAOs for the first time, like many people here, what are some things you can do to be a good DAO participant? So tongue in cheek, I'll say, uh, if, if you are a participant in the DAO, you're being a good DAO participant because most people that say they're in a DAO don't actually participate. Um, and that's a problem. Um, so, you know, with that, like, okay, what does that mean in more tangible words? Uh, go read the governance forum. Uh, that's where all of the different discussions are had. Um, you know, for some examples, like Uniswap has 180,000 token holders, plus or minus. Uh, they have 10,000 people in their governance forum, and that's like people that have like signed up uh, and are able to like comment or say anything. Uh, you know, a very small fraction of those people are actually participating in the air. So you're you're talking like very very small subsections of these organizations are actually active. Um, go talk, like ask questions, um, read what's going on because. Uh, you know, that's how you actually just participate in the organization, do it for a long enough time, and all of a sudden you might find yourself being one of the core contributors. I say it just sort of depends on what your personality is like. I find a lot of DAOs are basically like a subreddit with a Discord who has money, and, uh, and like there are certain people who enjoy lurking. Oftentimes, most people enjoy lurking. I don't know if any of you are Redditors, um, but... Most people just enjoy being able to take a look at what's going on. And then there are some people who really enjoy being way more active and stuff. The people who are lurking have their own reasons and like what they consider success in terms of like being able to be part of their favorite subreddit. And so there are some discords where I'm not very active and I just like to go in and take a look at sort of what's going on or I'll go take a look at what like the government, uh, the, the forums are saying. 
And then there are other ones where I'm like quite active. And so my honest opinion would be like to go feel it out, hang out in different channels, hang out in different like categories, see what feels right, see what the energy is like. Anyone who's like digital native can suss out energy through people on the internet. Like sometimes you look at someone with just a digital profile and you're like, you're sketchy as fuck. Um, <laughs> you know, and then there's other ones where you're like, oh, like this person's cool. So like my suggestion would be just like experiment. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, I, I, <laughs> dead on. It was very accurate. <laughs> Um, so, um, one, uh, piece of career advice, uh, for those of you who are sort of thinking about, you know, what's next and uh, should I go into crypto? Hopefully most of you are planning to go into crypto, but I think the best way, you know, if you're in a interview investing role, operating role, role, you know, if you're participating in governance forums, you're like immediately at the top of the list of any project, right? Um, um, I, it's an incredible way to make an impact. And if you show that you've followed a project, deeply enough that you can sort of contribute to conversation and steer it one way. That's an incredible way to um, demonstrate your ability to make an impact um, in, in Web3. Um, the second sort of piece of advice I have is it's it's very, very difficult to make an impact on more than two DAOs. Um, you know, I do Chainforest full-time and FWB part-time. I think this idea that some people had, you know, 12 months ago that you can be in like six DAOs and, you know, be active in all of them. I think I, I, I think I don't know how that is uh, possible. Um, so like, um, so I would say, you know, in terms of how to engage, you know, one, I would say, just pick one or two projects to go really, really deep on. And then after that, you know, just figure out ways to step up. You know, for me in FWB, I had left my job trying to figure out what I was going to do next. And then there was uh, an election for treasurer of the city DAO, the city sub DAO of FWB. And I applied for it. I ran. I, you know, um, gave a speech in, um, in like a in the Discord chat or like this Discord voice channel. Um, and then behind the scenes, I uh, messaged everyone I knew um, in FWB to to vote for me. It's kind of like a high school election. And that was how I got my entry into um, Web three. And it was a very, you know, wasn't paid a lot. You know, it was a very small job. But like, you know, it, it made a huge difference in be, me being able to get into um, Web three. So it, it's kind of just start small and you know, the opportunities just kind of show up in, in Web3. Yeah, I'd double down on that. I think, you know, after you do your exploratory phase and you kind of choose those one or two DAOs that interest you the most, um, I think it's kind of important to identify, like, you know, what function interests you the most. Is it like business development? You know, are you interested in, you know, developing? Are you interested in, you know, capital allocation, et cetera? And then, you know, kind of being like, um, you know, well-versed and um, really focus on that one function that will really drive a lot more value to the pro protocol um, than you know just trying to cover a bunch of different types of uh, functions. Yeah, totally agree with everything that was said. Um, I just as an example, by the way, Reverie, where where I work, we our literal mission is to help protocols and, and help them grow, and we only work with about five, and that's all we do all day. And that's because that's how much bandwidth it takes to really focus on any given DAO. But um, I, I will say that it, it can be a bit daunting to like just go head first and like try to start commenting on, on forums and that sort of thing. You have to develop a bit of a thick skin. There's people out there who maybe don't write in the most polite way and, and the nicest of ways. Uh, so one other method is to kind of hang around the Discord, see who maybe the community manager is or somebody who's very active and DM them, you know, give them a shout and just be like, yo, like, I'm really interested in this. Can you tell me more? Probably, I would say 99% chance they're going to be very happy to talk to you. We'll give you lots of super valuable information and they'll make you feel more comfortable. They can answer some of the initial questions that you have that maybe you don't want to post publicly, that sort of thing. And then you can kind of get a better sense for the community that's there. Another one that I'll throw out there, um, I also lead the grants program for DYDX. Grants programs are uh, amazing initiatives for people to join communities in a way that kind of incentivizes them a bit more and allows them to get a bit more skin in the game by um, agreeing to perform some sort of project or development or some sort of activity on behalf of the community and get rewarded for that. And it's we, we use it at DYDX as a way of actually kind of onboarding and recruiting new contributors to then basically like nerd slide them into becoming full-time contributors for DYDX. And I think a lot of protocols do the same thing. And so that's another great way of, of joining. I just realized that we're in Telegram. 
each other. I was like, DYDX. We talked to them for grants, and they were talking about finalizing their own grants program. Men and looked, and you were the person saying that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, a lot of Telegram chats, yeah. Oh, that's pretty funny how you can be uh, members of the same down and then meet each other in person and, and not not really know um, something something special about it. Um, so we, we've been going for about 40 minutes here. So we have five minutes left. Um, and in these last five minutes, I'd love to just ask each of you, as we have many people who might be getting involved for DAOs for the first time, uh, what is your favorite DAO and what do you love most about it? I got to say Gitcoin, uh, I think it's awesome that we've given out, as of yesterday, almost 70 million bucks. And companies that have originally been grantees include Uniswap, Optimism, Dune, Yearn, MakerDAO, Bankless, EtherJS, Wallet Connect, like the amount of multi-billion dollar impact that our grants program has had giving money to open source software developers, rivals, and probably eviscerates any VC that exists. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like we have to use this opportunity to plug our own <laughs> projects. So, I mean, um, Chain Forest uh, started as a Telegram chat, and it was really the place that I used as my open notebook when I was exploring Web3, trying to figure out what I was going to do. And after a couple months, people said, hey, the level of conversation here is so thoughtful and the people are so great. You've already found what you're going to do. Just sort of turn it into something. Don't look for some other idea. And this, uh, this sort of true community that we've created where people actually get to know each other, really get to educate themselves. You know, people already have said that it's changed their lives to be a part of this uh, community. So would encourage all of you, if you're interested, to um, apply. We're launching in um, three weeks, but, you know, I think it can be an, an, a special home base, and I think it can revolutionize the future of venture capital to make it more open, um, uh, uh, allow a broader network to access it, and allow people to generate wealth from venture capital without having to contribute to capital um, in the first place. So be on the lookout. Um, we're, we're launching in three weeks. Yeah, so um, I have a friend, his name is Luke, and he started Luke Dow. Um, they don't really do anything, but it's just a bunch of people whose name is Luke. And I think it's pretty awesome. Not sure how many of you would be interested in joining Luke Dow, but yeah, if you want to be part of a community that has around 25 people on Telegram right now, uh, let me know. Uh, inadvertent shill. Uh, but I'll go with uh, sort of two twofold of Osmosis and DYDX, which are both on Commonwealth, amazing DAOs. Uh, but um, sort of starting with DYDX, like what I think is really amazing that they've done is uh, like DYDX is so successful because they really focused on like a single customer archetype. Uh, DYDX doesn't care about having the most users. They care about being the best platform for the people that are moving the most money in derivatives markets. Um, and for that reason, their volume, you know, on many days is even higher than like Coinbase. Um, and so, you know, I think from them, they then also really embodied this like progressive decentralization path. And so, you know, it's like sometimes you see DAOs where they're like, we're going to immediately airdrop token to, you know, a hundred thousand different people. And it's going to be fully like, we're not making decisions. You're not making decisions. We're all not making decisions together, which is just not effective. Um, you know, they really took the approach of, we see a product opportunity. We're going to execute on it. Well, we're going to slowly open up control to the community um, and ensure that we actually do this effectively versus just like uh, ideologically. Uh, on the flip side, I think Osmosis has done an amazing job of building out a robust organizational structure for their DAO. Um, they have really complicated sub DAO infrastructure uh, of how they allocate funding to different operations, uh, and you know for that reason, I think they've done one of the best jobs of actually like decentralizing their operational stack. Yeah, uh, thank you, George. I don't have to talk about the YDX and Osmosis now, which uh, we're going to be my two as well. Uh, yeah, Reverie helps run the grants programs for both DYDX and Osmosis, and we're active in both communities. And uh, yeah, echo everything that George said. So I'm just going to throw out a, another one out there, which is Developer DAO. That's one that um, I, I've kind of I, have, I don't participate, but I'm in the Discord. And I like to just hang around there. It's a great community of people who um, are just actively in the space, working on finding development projects and jobs, and and 
if you're a developer and you're just kind of like looking to get into crypto, it's it's a really welcoming place to help find um, different things to do and friends. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks.